Hello, everyone. This is uh, Professor Joseph Holbrook. It's a pleasure to be back with you again in another episode of our ongoing series on Introduction to Christian History. And uh, I am proceeding onward to the uh, Age of Missions near the end of Chapter 4 of Alistair McGrath's excellent book from 2013, Christian History and Inter Introduction. And today we're covering pages 267 through 272, and I've added a little bit of material near the end, or maybe for the next episode, on Afro-Caribbean and Afro-American missions. So let's go ahead and jump in. And, oops, I'm in the wrong spot. There we go. Again, I'm in the wrong spot. Let me go back. And... Here's our outline. We are we are going to uh, begin with uh, the age of mission, the origin of Protestant missions, the issue of colonialism, the case of Anglicanism, that is the Church of England, and then if there's time, we'll talk about Afro-American and Afro-Caribbean missionaries, and if not, I'll do that in a in a subsequent recording later this week. So. Um, so the Catholics were uh, very early on involved in missions. I think I talked to you a few weeks ago about the 12 Franciscan missionaries who landed in Veracruz, Mexico in 1524, shortly after the conquest of the Aztecs by Hernan Cortez. And they were there to uh, evangelize Mexico's indigenous peoples, which they did by the, by their accounts, if you take them at face value, by the hundreds of thousands, and usher in the uh, kingdom of the spirit. That was uh, 1524, and even much earlier, the Catholic missionaries had been involved before the Protestant Reformation in missionary outreach. And of course, during this time, the uh, Spain and Portugal the Catholic maritime powers in Western Europe opened new trade routes to Africa and India, as well as the newly discovered Americas and uh, the 1490s and early 1500s. Of course, the Portuguese uh, explored down the coast of Africa and around the tip of Africa and eventually made it to India. Um, so this this... Catholic missionary work was not coordinated in Rome. It was coordinated at the national level. So French missionaries had a Parisian mission society called the Société des Missions Étrangères de Paris, the Paris Society for Mission, Foreign Missions, which played an important role in missionary work in Indochina, for example, in uh, Vietnam. And uh, so... Then there were, of course, Spanish. At the Spanish level, there were Spanish missionaries working throughout Latin America. Uh, this began to change in the 17th century. A uh, central ecclesiastical authority was formed called the uh, the Roman Congregatio de Propaganda Fide. The Congregation for the Spreading of the Faith was, a pub was established in 1622. Pope Urban VIII established a training school for missionaries in Rome in 1627. And so this is the beginning of a different approach. These attempts to centralize missionary strategy and provide missionary training strengthened its religious character and encouraged scientific and linguistic education of the missionaries, preparing the way for the creation of an indigenous clergy in the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Um, Protestantism got off to a slow start. There were some theological barriers. There were some uh, Calvinist and Lutheran theologians who believed that the Great Commission ceased to be imperative at the end of the Apostolic Age and that it was not necessary that God's grace God's grace would convert the peoples who need to be converted, that missionary activity was not a necessary uh, mediation. Uh, but as 
the long 19th century progressed Protestantism began to be, uh, actually in the 18th century, Protestantism was building trading links, colonial activities, international outreach, and Great Britain particularly came to the forefront and developed a role in missionary work as it expanded as a global imperial power. And so that brought a change of mentality among the Protestants. Holland and England were the primary Protestant maritime powers. Uh, in contrast to Spain and Portugal, for the Catholics. And as the confidence among Protestant missionary agencies increased, there was a corresponding loss of confidence in the Catholic counterparts during the 18th century. One of these, uh, one of these things that happened in the 18th century was the suppression of the Society of Jesus in 1773. In, in other words, the Jesuits. This had a negative impact on the Catholic missionary work, especially in South America and Asia, uh, and it led to the loss of some 3,000 missionaries. Pretty intense. The Catholic Church was seriously weakened by the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars and found itself distracted from missionary work. I just want to mention a couple of excellent films that you can watch about the Jesuit order and their missionary outreach. This one is The Mission with Robert De Niro, one of my all-time favorite films. From uh, It was uh, made in 1986, and it has uh, Robert De Niro, a young Liam Neeson, and Jeremy Irons, one of my favorite British actors. And it takes place in Paraguay. And it gives a very detailed explanation for the uh, political backdrop to the expulsion of the Jesuits from South America. This is another one of my favorite films. Black Robe is not as well known. It was directed in 1991 and it tells the story of a Jesuit priest who journeys across Can Canada in the 1630s in order to reach a Jesuit mission station and it uh, focuses very interestingly on the the parallel cos cosmologies, the uh, contrasting worldviews of the Iroquois Indians, and, or I'm sorry, the Algonquin Indians and the French Jesuits. And it's a story of love at the end, and how they this uh, black robe the uh, french jesuit comes to respect and to love the indian chief and to respect his beliefs another uh, film that's a little more uh, a little darker perhaps is silence directed in 2016 by martin corsesi including andrew garfield adam driver liam neeson again it's about two jesuit priests who travel to japan to work as missionaries and then come under severe persecution by the Tokugawa shogunate and uh, end up having to being put under pressure to deny their faith. Uh, I think it may be based on a true story, but it's uh, well worth watching, uh, if although it may be a bit depressing. So, back to our notes. Um, so there's three films that are worth watching. Unfortunately, there are not nearly as many. Uh, there's not. I'm not aware of any good missionary films from a Protestant perspective. So, uh, the there like as I said earlier, there was a theological barrier to Protestant missions, and this pattern of uh, biblical interpretation began to change. Uh, also, there was a, the expansion of Protestant sea power, primarily through England and Holland leading to Protestant colonies in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. It was also the development of the voluntary society, which bypassed churches who resisted uh, doing mission work uh, in order to uh, attempt to reach out and do the mission work. Uh, that continues today. The Reformed and Lutheran theologians of the 8th, 16th, and early 17th centuries, such as Theodore Besa and Johann Gerhard, argued that the Great Commission came to an end with the close of the Apostolic Age. And uh, this began to be questioned 
and the king, there was a reversal of this theological opinion, and partly that was uh, catalyzed by the voyages of exploration in the 18th century. This brings us to a picture of William Carey, the father of Protestant missions uh, in, in the early 19th century. So William Carey was a young British man who uh, began to feel a concern about missions. He became one of the most important British missionaries to India, and he uh, he would he kind of led the way in developing a, a, a consciousness of the importance of missions among the English Protestant public. The what of originally got him thinking about it was reading Captain Cook's account of his voyages in the South Seas. So this uh, expansion of Protestant sea power led to the establishment of Protestant col colonies. A colony was a region under the authority of the state. Therefore, the state church exercised pastoral and evangelistic missionary authority. The first major Lutheran mission was located in India by the Danish. There were also Dutch colonies in Indonesia and also the Caribbean, which led to the establishment of Dutch Reformed churches. Uh, there was also the, the uh, British, the American Virgin Islands, including St. Thomas, uh, were purchased from the Danish, and originally they were Lutheran Danish, and also uh, became the home of some Moravian missionaries, as we shall see. Great Britain was by far the most active colonial power, with the result that English-speaking forms of Protestantism became widely established through imperial expansion, especially in the Indian subcontinent, the Caribbean, and Australasia. Let me... Uh, Show you another picture. This is a picture of uh, the uh, Caribbean. And of course, the Dutch and the English and the French began to infiltrate into what were formerly the Spanish holdings in the Caribbean. And you see there on the upper part the uh, Bahamas, which was British, the Turks and Caicos. Uh, over to the uh, the right or the east of Puerto R Puerto Rico, you see the uh, uh, the the uh, American Virgin Islands, which were at the time were Danish, Saint Thomas, the British Leeward Islands. There's a couple of French islands in here: Guadeloupe and Martinique. Barbados was a key island early on. Eventually, Trinidad and Tobago became a British territory. And over here you see the ABC islands, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao, which were uh, home to the Dutch Reformed Church. Also in 1655, the uh, British took Jamaica from the Spanish, and of course it became Church of England or the Anglican Church. And then over here is Belize. And we will talk more late, later about the Moravians and the, the Methodists, the Baptists, who came later than the Church of England and the Dutch Reformed Church. So these were the early, uh, oh, I forgot to mention Guyana, way down here, between Venezuela and Brazil, so to speak. Um, so we'll continue with that. So, in the second half of the 18th century, missionary leadership passed into the hands of entrepreneurial individuals through these voluntary societies who created dedicated missionary societies which focused specifically on the objective of overseas mission. These consisted of highly motivated individuals who arranged their own fundraising, created support groups, and identified and recruited missionaries. Churches were seen as having their own institutional agendas, which failed to engage with the missionary imperative. Such matters are best left to dedicated individuals rather than being defeated by ecclesiastical bureaucracies.
this is a, among Protestants. It was a little different among Catholics, whereas we had the Catholic Church coexisting, and within the Catholic Church, co you had missionary type societies like the Jesuits. Uh, the London Missionary Society was an example of one of these early voluntary societies. Uh, they got behind William Carey and helped raise money for his missionary work in India, uh, particularly among those working for the abolition of slavery, were also very committed to this concept of foreign missions. A Baptist minister began to gather together with a group of interested persons, both lay and ordained, and they met in Baker's Coffee House in London to plan how they might develop interdenominational missionary work. As the number of supporters grew and funds were raised, the ship was purchased and missionaries recruited, and a potentially significant mission was undertaken to the islands of the South Sea. And I have, a, I have an image for that. This is a painting of the uh, arrival of missionaries and one of the, uh, with Captain James Williams sent there to do mission work in one of the South Sea Islands. So that was the mission to Tahiti. Um, this came in the wake of Captain James Cook's voyages, the discovery of Australia. I believe I don't I don't see a date for that. The first major missionary expedition to the region was launched in 1796 with 30 missionaries who went set sail for Tahiti. Uh, one of the s somewhat uh, perplexing complications was that the mission discovered uh, considerable differences between European views of sexuality and the views of sexuality that was prevalent among the Tahitians, which uh, was a bit of a shock for the these missionaries in the uh, from England. It's long been recognized that there was a link between missionary work and the rise of colonialism. This is an important mi issue: the issue of colonial missions. The presence of Catholic missions in Latin America, for example was directly linked to Spanish and Portuguese commercial, military, and political interests in this area. One great example of the link between colonialism and mission was the policies of Great Britain and the development of the colonial Church of England in its territories. This was particularly notable in the Caribbean. The rise of Great Britain as a naval and colonial power in the 18th century created a link between the expansion of British national interests and the establishment of colonial outposts of the National English Established Church, which is the Church of England. It is impossible to tell the story of Anglicanism without reference to the rise of the British Empire. So there were two distinct phases in the process of the Anglicanization of Crown Colonies. One, uh, one period was between 1780 and 1830. The Crown actively de uh, sought to develop links between the church and state in its colonies. In British North America, that is, the uh, well, that's right around the time of the Revolution or the War of Independence. The replication of English ecclesiastical structures was seen as a means of consolidating the stability and maintaining the distinct British cultural identity of the colonies. Although the Church of England was involved in this, it was primarily driven by the colonial agendas of the period. The second phase began around 1830 with the election of a Whig government in England. Uh, no longer was the British government concerned to replicate English ecclesiastical system, which privileged the Church of England throughout its dominions. From that point on, it would be the church, or rather, it would it would be the church rather than the state, which took upon itself 
the responsibility for extending Ang Anglicanism overseas. In other words, the Anglican Church was on its own to compete with uh, other churches such as Methodists and Baptists. There were two leading English Af Anglican missionary societies in this period. The Church Missionary Society, founded in 1799, and the Society for Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. They really liked long titles back in those days, which was founded much earlier, both of which had experience of recruiting both missionaries and chaplains for British colonial settlers now played an increasingly important role in selecting clergy and bishops for the colonies. And this brings us to uh, our story about uh, Afro-Caribbean and Afro-American missionaries. And uh, I'm going to stop here and continue our session in it, uh, later this week. Thank you very much for your kind attention, as always. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me through the YouTube comments section, or you can email me or call me. I'll be more than happy to talk with you. Take care. See you later. Bye.